It is a January early afternoon in 2003 and everything seems normal at the West Pharmaceutical Company's factory in Kinston, North Carolina. At 1.30 in the afternoon, the mundane regularity is obliterated by an explosion. Today we're looking at the West Pharmaceutical Services disaster. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. background. So I'm going to level with you. For way too long I thought this disaster and the West Texas explosion were the same event and after I covered the West explosion in my head I deleted this one off the list. I was wrong, something about the word West must be explosive. Anywho, today we're looking at the West pharmaceutical explosion and this event took place here in Kinston, North Carolina. This is the West Pharmaceuticals Company's facility. Now you'd think that this place would make pharmaceuticals, like, you know, medicine. Well, you'd be wrong, as here is the site of the manufacturer of medicine delivery device components. Mainly rubber-based parts such as syringe plungers, stoppers and other seals. The site had been home for West Pharmaceuticals since 1975, and by the noughties, nearly 300 people worked there. Now I should say, the Kinston plant was one of the company's 18 factories scattered across the US and Europe. Manufacturing ran for between 5 and 6 days each week on a 24 hour working period. The site was in an industrial area with only a couple of residential properties nearby. So we need to look at the process that was in operation at Kinston. Now all the facts and figures, as well as the disaster timeline, came from the brilliant CSB report. And as always, the links will be below. Rubber, rubber, rubber. So the plant ran an automated system that compounds the rubber. There were two production lines, which were pretty much the same in the way they worked. Each production line was fed by a place called the kitchen. But I'm warning you now, don't eat anything that this kitchen produces. So in the kitchen, all the required ingredients for production are measured out, placed in totes and lifted up to the next floor via a tote elevator. From there, they are transported along one or two conveyor belts to the beginning of the two production lines to the mixers. Now the mixers were on the second floor and they generate a lot of heat when working. In part of the process, the mixer needs the ingredients a little bit like a dough mixer in a bakery. As I mentioned, this generates a lot of heat, which is caused by friction. This heat is generally controlled by slowing the mixer, but also cooling water is used. After the rubber is sufficiently mixed, a door opens in the bottom of the mixer and the contents fall into a bucket, after which it is transported to the milling machine. So milling roughly shapes the rubber mixture into flat cut strips. From there it runs towards the batch off machine. On the way, it is run through a slurry of water and polyethylene powder. This cools the rubber, and for the most part, the powder makes its way into the rubber. However, not all. This is a point in which powder buildup can be experienced. Right next, it runs past some fans and then runs to the batch off machine, where it is stored for either shipping or further molding. Dust was an issue at West Pharmaceutical and it was taken very seriously. They had cleaning teams at work almost 24 hours a day, cleaning any services that gathered dust. The site also employed a comprehensive system of air ventilation, dehumidification and filtering. Now on face value, the site was pretty clean and tidy. I mean, it had to be because the products were destined for the medical world. But it would seem that the non-dusty looks could be deceiving, because although employing multiple cleaning teams, an area was often missed. This was above the actual batch machines in its suspended acoustic tiled ceiling. The plant would seem to be running happily along on the 29th of January 2003 and this leads us rather neatly onto the disaster. The disaster. It is just after lunchtime on the 29th of January 2003 and work at West Pharmaceutical seems to be going as normal. Production is well underway and the cleaners are doing their usual thing making effort to remove any visible signs of dust. Now we don't know for certain, but around mill two, a heating event occurred, maybe from a light fixture, an overhot rubber batch, or even a random spark, which ignited 
settled dust above the machine room. As many workers would later say to investigators, it seems like any normal working day. However, just before half one in the afternoon, an explosion ripped through the factory. The explosion had raged out of the compounding area. The roof of the facility had been blown off and in the rubble many were buried. The sudden shock of the explosion took so many people by surprise. After all, most on site didn't realise whether an explosion was possible, especially after all the cleaning. Now, the disaster narrative here does seem a little bit abrupt, but for those at West Farmer at the time, there was no warning signs or even no uneasy feelings in the morning leading up to the explosion. A smoke plume rose into the sky, signalling disaster to all within sight. Near the plant, in the same industrial park, was a National Guard Quartermaster Battalion. Within minutes, National Guard personnel clambered onto the west site. Some survivors were helped free and National Guard members helped firefighters and police search for any trapped. Some survivors were stranded clinging to the exposed steel frame of the now wrecked rubber manufacturing centre on the second floor which would require ladders for evacuation. Injured workers were triaged on site at the lesser damaged northern area of the plant. The most injured were evacuated via helicopter. In total, six would be killed in the explosion, mainly from heat-related injuries, but a couple would die from blunt force trauma injuries from the falling debris. The site was damaged beyond usage and... As such, 14 months after the explosion, the facility was relocated a few miles away. West would have to pay out a few hundred thousand in fines for the disaster, and a class action lawsuit was brought against the company from nearby residents, but it was thrown out in 2006. The EPA was called in to take air samples due to the risk of contamination, and West hired in a company called Hepico to set up a water filtration system to reduce the contaminated water runoff on the thousands of gallons used by the firefighters. But what we would like to know is how did the disaster happen? Well, long-term friends of the channel, the CSB would be the ones to drill down to the cause. The investigation. Almost as soon as the explosion occurred, the cause was the question on everybody's minds. The CSB would begin the investigation process by interviewing survivors, and a rather average portrait of the day was described. No alarm or concerns were apparent. However, a few of those interviewed mentioned thick dust above the suspended ceilings in the milling room. Some dust was from non-combustible materials, such as clay, but some was found to be polyethylene, which was used in the anti-tack slurry mix. Testing of the wreckage of of the plant showed the area of maximum explosive force was around mill 2. It was found that the initial explosion dislodged more dust, aerating it, making it more susceptible to further fires and explosions. During the beginning of the blast, water sprinkler lines were severed, which would hinder firefighting efforts. The CSB would dig deeper and find that when the automatic compounding system employed on site was installed in 1985, fire regulations were, shall we say, less than perfect. Designers at the time used the best practices for dust mitigation, but clearly it wasn't enough. The CSB would summarise their findings in their 2003 report. West Pharmaceutical Services Incorporated did not perform an adequate engineering assessment of the use of powdered zinc sterilite and polyethylene as anti-tac agents in the rubber batch-off process. The company's engineering management systems did not ensure that relevant industrial fire safety standards were consulted. The company's management systems for reviewing MSDS is did not identify combustible dust hazards. The hazard communication program at the Kinston facility did not identify combustible dust hazards or make the workforce aware of such. Dust explosions are a thing to be very scared of, not only because of the deadly results, but that they aren't fully understood still. I remember this being a big fear years back when I worked in a bakery in the late noughties. And sadly, West is another example of why dust can be deadly. So it is disaster scale time. I'm going to give it a three or a four. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know below. This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons, Attribution, Share Like Licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently wet and windy corner of southern london uk i have 
Instagram and Twitter, or X, whatever you like to call it, as well as a second YouTube channel. So check them out for other bits and pieces of what I get up to. I'd like to have a warm thank you to my in to my YouTube and Patreon members for your financial support and the rest of you for tuning in every week. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching and Mr. Music, play us out please.